So we're going to give you guys an opportunity to ask questions and engage in a dialogue um, with the young men. And again, be willing to get uncomfortable. Be willing to ask uncomfortable questions. We're not going to be offended. We just want to get to the heart of the matter. Is that all right? Yeah. All right, wonderful. So I'm going to throw out a couple of softball questions um, to the guys, but before I do, I would like for each of the men on the panel to introduce themselves and their affiliation because we have at least one person here who is a law student who played the role of the victor um, in that situation. So what you heard off, um, off stage was um, the voice of one of our law students who um, articulated the story of one of the young men in the program who moved out of state. So that's his real story. Um, but our law student was willing to share the story because we thought that it was an important one to share. So with that, we're going to start with Sadiq. I want you guys to um, say your name, any other information about yourselves, and then your affiliation, whether you're part of Brotherhood and your role if you're at Brotherhood or a law student. Sadiq. My name is Sadiq, and um, I'm the sales and event manager at Brotherhood Brew and uh, I'm also on the board of Brotherhood Inc. So. My name is Kentrell, and I'm a sales representative at Brotherhood. My name is Darius, and I'm a sales also. My name is Jazz Hampton. Hampton. I'm a student at the University of St. Thomas School of Law. I'm in my second year there. I'm a 23-year-old here from Minneapolis, Minnesota as well. My name is Kerry, and I'm Director of Communications for Brotherhood. My name is Phelan Pounds, and I'm Case Manager at Brotherhood. I'm Nate Shotley, and I am the Catering Manager at Brotherhood. So my first question um, is, can you talk about some of the unique challenges that young African-American men face? What are some of the unique challenges? I'm a teacher, so I will call on people. One of the things I struggle with a lot is, because I'm actually biracial, I'm Native American and black, um, I struggle with a sense of belonging. Um, I don't feel I fit in sometimes, and that's one of the things uh, I'm struggling with. I could just talk from my perspective and where I grew up. I grew up in Jackson, Mississippi, which is one of the poorest states, is the poorest state in the United States. And um, most of everyone that I knew was black. And the problems that we had to deal with was like, you know, I guess you could say extreme poverty because everybody I knew was, you know, poor. But I would say that some of the unique experiences that I had to deal with was the level of tension that was around me, around in the neighborhoods that I stayed in. It was like, if you're not from a certain neighborhood, you, you got to get up out of there, you know? Even if you're out of town. If you stay from out of town, I remember that my sister's baby dad ended up um, having his friend come to Mississippi from out of town. I don't know exactly what place, but he had, a form, he had an accent that I didn't recognize. But they came into town, and three hours after they made it into town, they came back to our house and dude was robbed for everything, closed everything. He didn't even have underwear on. And so I just found like, you know, that was kind of, that was, you know, that was crazy to me, because I was like, man, they didn't even, you know, want to leave the man his underwear. I'm like, that's wild, <laughs> you know? But that was just one of them, and just like the quick tempers, like everybody down there just had a quick temper, including myself, that I, I had to work that off, you know, when I came up here, because it's different. But it was just like the quick tempers, there was so much 
um, you know, poverty and frustration all concentrated in the same area and everybody was at each other's throats. So. Thank you. One thing I like to add on to that is just, just having a sense of self-worth and a self, sense of self-pride and just knowing who you are. I think so many of us lack that, that knowledge and that, that forces us to do what we see on television. And we all know what's portrayed as, as, you know, what we're portrayed as on TV. And um, so I feel like we just feed into that and we don't have too many positive role models to tell us that it's something better out there for us. And especially when you're in the neighborhood where all you see is this certain type of lifestyle. And so of course you're gonna gravitate toward it. And uh, I just feel like that that's one of our big issues is just seeing ourselves doing better and just having those opportunities to do better. And once I feel, I feel like once we're able to get those opportunities and get that sense of self pride and that sense of self-worth and just knowing that we're worth being in the community and that we're worth, you know, we, we can be an asset to society. And once we figure that out, I feel like a lot of us can go really far in life and just do positive, great things. Anyone else want to answer? I um, also just wanted to say that I think a lot of, the, like, our young men have to deal with this, you know, this facade of always being tough, you know. I think a lot of times that we get portrayed in the light of being, you know, aggressive. So sometimes, you know, we always worried about who looking at us, why they looking at us like that, and just being on guard about a lot of things. So when you get to see like the hearts of the young men, it, you know, you don't, a lot of times people always see that image, you know, that, that, that scowl we call it, you know. But when you talk to us and get to know us, and you get to know the different person. I think that is what affects the change and a lot of stuff that we do, just getting past that initial perception of what you know people portray us to be. Another thing is like I didn't learn that like I don't always gotta be in my like baggy clothes. Like I noticed the difference between being professional and then being like just norm, normal in a way. And once I learned the difference between that, it, I mean, it shows a lot that I can put on a suit or a tie whenever I need to, whatever like that, for business, like editing and stuff like that, like business situations and stuff. And I learned that I didn't have to, cause at first I didn't really like know how to quote with myself when I didn't have a suit and tie. I was just be like, well they just look at me as thug or something or as somebody that just want to be greedy and strive for nothing. But when I learned that I seen myself in a suit, it really, I woke up and said, well, I can accomplish a lot in just this one suit, this one outfit. <laughs> so, <laughs> so basically, basically the main thing is, is that, I mean, if I could talk to brothers and get them to understand just the way they carry themselves sometimes, you know, I mean, I could still live, I could be in the poor, like, neighborhood, but when you see me pop out with a suit and a tie on, you're going to know I'm, up, I'm striving for better. So, I mean, I, I just took a look at that. I looked in, my, I looked in the mirror, looked at myself, suit and tie on, and I looked at my surroundings. I was like, how can I change my surroundings? Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm not changed, but I'm looking better. But how can I make my surroundings start looking better? And I say, well, just lead the way. Everybody see you dressed up all nice. And it actually happened 
I mean, I don't know if it's been happening, but it played it played a part though, cause recently I was walking down the <coughs> I was walking down the street a while back, and I had a tie on. And everybody was like, "Bro, I didn't know that was you, bro." I'm like, <laughs> "Like, yeah, yeah, I'm on my business." <laughs> so. Chime in um, because he's, um, as I mentioned earlier, he's a law student and he's been working with the young men. So, what are some of the things that you've seen that maybe surprised you or reminded you of what you saw, you know, growing up? Yeah, so growing up, I grew up in Richfield, like I said, and uh, we lived in a small house. You can take like three big steps from front to back door. And uh, my dad is African American and my mom is white. Um, and we, growing up, took in African American youth that went to Richfield. For one reason or another, they'd live at our house, and we have a very small house. So there, there was like five, five guys, um, and they all lived in the basement. And I mean, I became best friends with them. And uh, when I, so when I learned about uh, these guys and learned about Brotherhood, that's when I knew I wanted to join that um, at St. Thomas. I'm actually, Professor Levy Pounds is my professor. We call her PLP. Um, <laughs> and so PLP is my professor at St. Thomas, and that's how I'm uh, connected with these guys. And so uh, I'm doing whatever, you know, there's policy work that needs to be done or a lot of things on that front. But what I enjoy most is just coming and hanging out with these guys. And um, I come in every week, usually on Fridays, and just kick it with these guys. And so that's how I got to know them. I didn't know any of these stories. I didn't know any of the background. I just got to know Sadiq. I got to know Trail Darius, all these guys. Um, and then about a month ago is when I heard these stories. And that's um, the story I read today was Christians, and he's unable to be here today. Um, and I would have, you would have never known it. You hear the way these guys speak, and you hear all the struggles they've come through, and you would never have a clue. And so any, any emotion or anything that I could convey from Christian's story today was the emotion I got when I sat there and I listened to this man's story. And you would never know it. I would never know that he had any of these issues. He's just a happy young man that was proud to be a part of Brotherhood. And so seeing him in this organization and seeing what Brotherhood does for everyone, it's amazing. And I'm just honored to be a part of it. And, you know, I, I was coming here to help with policy reform and maybe, you know, see what I could help with these guys. But, man, I feel like they helped me. I, they helped me more than I could have imagined and more than I could ever do for them. I know that. Um, so I, I'm really appreciative, and now uh, I work at a law firm right now in St. Paul doing civil litigation, but now I, I started volunteering at the Anoka County Public Defender's Office, and we started doing that next, uh, next semester, actually. So my eyes have been open to a lot of the issues that I knew were there, but maybe wasn't going to pursue in my legal career. So thank you. Thank you. Carrie, you wanted to chime in? Yeah, that was just... Can y'all hear me? Yeah. Okay. I just want to say that um, what I found, I don't, I'm not quite sure if it's unique, but what, when Kentrell was talking, it made me think about it, was the fact that he was talking about when he's dressed nice, you know, um, how he feel and everything, and how people perceive him when he's dressing nice. But a lot of times, a lot of people's perceptions and assumptions about us when we dress like, you know, professionally or you know even business casual people start to assume like either we're going to a funeral or we're going to court i'm like <laughs> have y'all ever heard of a job interview <laughs> you know maybe i have a job where i just dress i wear nice clothes too you know you never and it just sometimes it, it kind of offends me because it was like that that's something that i had to deal with personally um i had to deal with that like two times in one day actually we had um, our spring gala that we have, um, it's called the Night of Brotherhood, and we have it every year. And I was dressed nice, we ended up getting these clothes from this, this place, but anyways, I had on a really nice suit, our money suit, I must say. <laughs> <laughs> anyways, so I was feeling great that day, and I wanted to go get my hair cut and everything, because I wanted it to really look nice. So when I got over to the barbershop that I go to all the time, by the time I got into the door, people were already asking me questions like, hey man, where are you going today, man? You, got, you going to a funeral or something? Oh, you going to court? <laughs> then they hit me with the job interview. I'm like, no, neither one of them. I got something I'm doing with my job. I'm like, I just felt like that offended me. But right after I ended up doing that, I ended up turning the corner and there were some younger guys out there, they were black but they were probably around like 15, 16. And they were like, what's up, big bro? I'm like, what's up, y'all? And they was like, where you going? You got a funeral or something? I'm like, oh my God. And I'm like, it just says something about, you know, how people 
what people think when they see us dress nice, it was bothering me because I want to change that perception. So, yeah. Now we're going to um, open it up for some questions from the audience. We have a hand up there and a hand there. program in social justice. I don't need this. Uh, I'll talk louder. What has happened at the University of Minnesota and surrounding is there have been a number of uh, alerts from our campus police about the black men with hoodies who are robbing the challenges is when you say there's a black man with a hoodie. You see on the stage that... <laughs> we were not calling you a suspect, Derek. <laughs> but, but in reality, on any given day, any of these young men could be wearing a hoodie. They all look different, different shades, different hair color. So such a generic description means that they would all be seen as a suspect. And in fact, many of them have stories that they come into the office and share of times when they're walking the street and suddenly they're being pulled over, they're being searched without permission, they're being harassed. Um, and I'll get to you so you can share. Guns drawn, I mean, just craziness. We had similar issues at St. Thomas with our um, public safety officers. And essentially, the faculty, um, African-American faculty, sent emails, and we were talking amongst ourselves about our concerns. Because not only were the alerts saying, you know, there's a black man who did this, but it would be a hyper alert. Like, there's a black man on the loose, and he's running with, and it's like, what? So it just creates this air of tension and fear and stress amongst people. And the, again, the descriptions are so generic. Even if you read it, it's very difficult to identify who actually did it without some other mark or some other characteristic. And like you said, students are often mistaken as suspects um, in those situations. So we actually started a series of conversations with our public safety department to get them to shift their articulation um, of those issues. Not to minimize, you know, the seriousness of whatever, you know, the underlying crime is, but to say, well, can you take a step back, take the emotion out of whatever the issue is, especially if it's not an exigent circumstance, someone that is, you know, um, running through the hall with a gun or, you know, something crazy like that. If it's not an exigent circumstance, then you don't need to put out a hyper alert. You can take a step back and write a description with the cool head and make sure that you have information that's actually going to identify the person. If you don't have that, then you need to take a, di a completely different approach. So I think the conversations with the department um, will be important. I think looking at best practices for public safety officers in a multicultural community is important and applying the pressure on the powers that be to make sure that there's appropriate training amongst um, security officers. You wouldn't believe how often we hear stories of students across various college and university campuses who are harassed, especially men of color, African American and Latino men, and even Native American men, because of the issues that you articulated. When you start looking at the training of um, the security officers and even law enforcement, you realize that the training on cultural competence, on race-related issues, on poverty-related issues, on mental health issues, is slim to non-existent. 
So one of the things we have to begin to do is to apply the pressure, ask that the training be revamped, and be willing to uh, persevere and not take no for an answer. So that's what I would recommend. Control has um, a story that he wants to share. Go ahead, Control. Um, basically, just hopping on top of what Nikima was talking about, stereotyping. I, I was just getting off of work and I was walking with my buddy Demonte, and then it's two times they did this, but one time he wasn't with me. But the first time he was, we was just walking over on Dale, and we hit Tommy Street, and we turned by the gas station because that's the way Demonte house was, and I was just walking him home, and I was gonna go about my business, but as we walking past the store, okay. We just walk it, and I got on the blue. Ho I had on a blue Hollister hoodie, and it said Hollister on my sleeve. And Demonte had on his red jacket, which he got on right now, but he didn't have on his Brotherhood shirt. This is Demonte. <laughs> <laughs> and we was walking, and then three cops came out of nowhere, and. One of them was just, I had a smart water, a smart water, like a bottle of smart water. And he was just, I think he was swinging it or whatever, but he was like coming towards the way. Like, and we didn't panic or nothing when we seen the police because we was just innocent civilians. So basically, we was innocent people. We didn't do nothing. So we just kept walking. And it was like, stop right now. Don't move. Stop. And it was like, you talking to us? Like, stop. And I was, and that's when he came, and then he got physical, and he was like, don't move, or whatever. And he started searching me and everything like that. Didn't even tell me what was going on and why he was searching me or anything like that. All in my personal space, and I just was like, what's going on here? And he was, when he sat me and Demonte down on the curve, this man, all he got to say, all he got to say is, oh, it was a robbery that happened and somebody was wearing a hoodie just like that, that had Hollister on the side of the sleeves. I'm like, so you get me because somebody got robbed, so you come for me? Okay. We got, they didn't put it in the handcuffs or in the back of the car. We got let go, we left. I'm walking. Like, about four, five days after that, I'm walking by myself, it's nighttime, and I'm walking to university, and I just decides to walk up to Super America off his cash work, and I'm walking, and I was mean somebody. I think I was supposed to be mean somebody, or whatever, but I didn't know if they were at home, so I just, I was just standing in front of the store, in all actuality, I wasn't doing nothing wrong. Didn't have no drugs on me, no weapons, nothing. So, again, I'm innocent. I was standing in front of the store, and then the cop's car just came right around the corner. At first, I seen him when I was getting ready to cross the street to get to the gas station. I seen him, and they mugged me. They mugged me, but I didn't care about that because I wasn't doing anything wrong. So I'm in front of the store, they came right around. And they hopped out the car, like, stop, don't move, stop right now. And I just got real just frustrated and I was like, man, what do y'all want from me? What is y'all doing? What, why is y'all keep asking me questions and like, well, if you don't stop wearing this Hollister hoodie. I'm like, bro, what? <laughs> And then I, I, and it was a, it was a Caucasian officer and a kind of Latino officer, and sorry to say, I said it, and I wasn't saying it as in like disrespectful towards my other brothers and sisters of this color, but I was telling him directly, why you won't mess with a white boy with a um, Hollister hoodie on? 
Why you getting me? Because of my character and how I look in the hoodie. And he felt stupid and he said something smart and all he had to do, he, all they did was drove off and it was like, well, next time we know the, uh, a, a proper manner. No, because you said that the first time when we was, when we pulled me into Monte over and you harassed us. You said you went, it wouldn't happen again and you, and you did it again. And it's just stuff like that. The fact that we walking past a store and they accusing one of us for doing something because we got on a similar hoodie or outfit and they already taken us as we just up to no good. That's just sad because like if I would have got out of line or anything and got the cussing at him and getting real like aggressive, I probably would have went down for something I ain't did just because I got mad and I was smart talking. They would have said, well, we going to give you this crime because that's basically what they were saying. They were just waiting for me to get real mad and cause a scene so they can pin something on me. So that's just sad, basically. There was a similar incident that happened um, maybe about, what, eight months ago um, to my husband, Phelan, and Contrell. They were uh, walking on Grand Avenue, and they were looking at different businesses in the area you know, who maybe would be interested in buying coffee from Brotherhood Brew. So Contrell had a little note card, and at one point he leaned against the wall and he was writing down information about the businesses. Well, a Caucasian woman saw him and ran into a Chipotle where um, an officer was eating lunch. And she said, there's a boy out there, you know, doing, writing graffiti on the, on the walls. So the officer puts down his lunch and he comes out there, even though Phelan was standing next to him, he didn't know if that was our son or anything. Right away, he just told Contrell, put your hands in the air. And basically proceeded to search Contrell um, without his permission and in, you know, the, in the public eye. They're the only African Americans on Grand Street at that time, which you know already feels uncomfortable. And now they have an officer searching this young man in the public view. And he's telling them, I didn't do anything wrong. And so when he searched them, all he saw was a note card and a pencil. Obviously, he can't do graffiti with that. So, <laughs> so, Phelan, so Phelan, you know, was, was really upset and just said to the officer, you know, this is really disrespectful. I want your contact information. So he took down his information and um, he told the officer that that was not appropriate to treat him less than human in that circumstance, and not only to assume that Contrell was up to no good, but that Phelan, as an adult man, was leading him up to no good, if you will. That had to be the perception for you to disregard an older adult standing there, not even address that person and treat that person with dignity. So once I found out about it, we had a conversation at the office, we picked up the phone, we called the chief, we talked to the assistant chief, we talked to the um, com district commander, and he wound up coming to the office and hearing directly from Contrell and Phelan about what happened and said he was going to use it as a teachable moment because that was unacceptable conduct on the part of the officer. So these are stories that on a regular basis we hear things like this from our young men. We pick up the phone and call. The problem, though, is when things like this are aired out in the public, we see it in the paper or on the news, most of us take what we've heard at face value which is typically not from these young men's perspective, and we dismiss it as being irrelevant or we blame the person. And that's how these injustices are able to perpetuate. When you look at the scandals with the Minneapolis Police Department and all the money that's paid out for excessive force, it's because of our silence that this is allowed to continue. But these young men, even though they've done a play, they've done an incredible job, they still have to leave here and walk these streets. And they don't know what they're going to encounter, and they don't know if we're going to really be um, advocating for them when we leave out of here. Because we don't want this to just be, oh, I heard a wonderful performance. We want this to actually change something in terms of our perceptions of these young men and what they experience. Is there another question? Hi, my name is Kulia, and I'm a student here at Metro State. and. Um, my question is, is I'm a, a, well not my question yet, but um, currently I'm about to be a teacher and I run a student organization here on campus called Students for Education Reform. 
So my main concern is, or my question is gonna be education related. Um, do you feel like your lack of, lack of knowledge of self, your frustration, your insecurity, insecurities of what others see you as, do you feel like your um, K, to, K through 12 education or lack of education contributed to some of the perceptions and conceptions that you guys experience? Sadiq. <clears throat> well, I, I kind of feel so because um, like I always say, like it, they always talk about a selective few uh, African-American leaders or whatever, you know, like historical people. And they just put those people like on a pedestal, not, not taking anything away from it, but I can't be no Martin Luther King or no Malcolm X, you know what I'm saying? And that's how we feel. So it's just like, why try to be something that we can't? And all they teach us is like, I mean, I, I'm big on history and uh, so I, I make a lot of history references. And, um, but like, they, they always teaching us something about what the white person had done. You know, no, no like, I'm not saying that there wasn't any great things or anything, but why are you teaching me this all the time? Like, I shouldn't still know the, the names of Christopher Columbus ships. You know, I shouldn't still know that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And I just feel like I, they, they, they really do lack um, a proper curriculum for African American students in African American neighborhoods, and you know, I just feel like that 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 lacks. That's why we lack on the education because it's not nothing that we want to engage in. You know, like why do I constantly hear about what this race has done? What has my race done? Like, it took me coming to to brotherhood to see a lot of the stuff that we're capable of doing and a lot of the stuff that we've done, that we have have did, and you know, that we're a big contributor to society, so. And you had a story too about when you were in school, one of the things that happened with your teacher. That's all, Bill's favorite story, so. <laughs> it is, I, he always called me out on it too, but. Uh, yeah, and, and just speaking about that, just, just the lack of our culture as well in the schools, like, even though they're like the teachers, they're, they're in our schools every day, but they don't really like make the effort to understand our culture and understand the way that we talk or to understand the way that we act and understand what's going on in our communities. And um, that can also hinder a student to not be proactive in school. Like it happened to me and <clears throat> I was like in the fourth grade and I also like Mav too. Like I, Mav just kind of clicked with me and it was pretty easy. And uh, one day I was, I was probably like in the fourth grade, uh, the teacher had put a problem on the board and I was the first one to raise my hand. And she was like, what's the answer? I was like, 44. She was like, wrong. And I was looking like, what? And then she called on the girl behind me and she was like, 44. <laughs> she was like, correct. And I was just like, I just said that. She's like, no, you said 44. The answer is 44. And you know what I'm saying? I, just that, you know what I'm saying, that, just, just showing us that we're wrong all the time, you know what I'm saying, like, that was the right answer, you know, but, yeah. <laughs> like, I kind of, but yeah, like, like I was saying earlier, it's, uh, it just made you not want to put the effort into, like, growing, like, for me, like, I always had, like, like I, I used to go to speech class and stuff, you know, because, Pronouncing words wasn't that good for me and everything. Um, but me being able to advocate for myself in school and tell these teachers certain things, you know what I'm saying? Like, and I get frustrated because they just look at me with this, this stare like, what is this guy talking about? You know what I'm saying? I just get frustrated and just leave. And so that, that hindered me from being proactive as well and trying to get more work done and trying to get more help because it's like they didn't understand me. And so. Several of you guys actually were placed in alternative schools as well, which is a constant challenge that we see amongst the young men who come into the program. They've already been pushed out a lot of times since elementary school into alternative programs. Go ahead, Control. Yeah, that's another reason, That plays a big part in the uh, school systems, too. This, it's like you segregating us 
because behavior issues, they say. Like, I was always in the class from fourth grade till high school, till I graduated. I was in an alternative class. And now, I, I switched schools, but they always put me in, the, they didn't take me to a school if it had an alternative program. And basically, it's, program is like they cut off a certain part of the school for just kids who they feel that got behavior issues and everything like that. And at first, I was like, okay, I'm in this program, but I'm like, all right, well, let me try to do good and not get out probably before the next grade or something. And then I started seeing other people getting in fights and stuff that was like in like the mainstream parts. And I'm like, why they ain't getting sent here? Why they not getting sent to the alternative part? And I just, when I seen that, that just aggravated me. And that's when I started feeling like, now I started feeling like they was like, trying to separate me out from everybody because I had something that nobody else had. And I mean, it's, it's, it, hurt, it, it hurted me during school because I'll be sitting up there with my sister, getting ready for school, getting on the bus. And when I get to school, I gotta go to a separate part of the school. Like in the cafeteria, I gotta eat at a set table, I can't go to another table or anything like that. So it was like barely times that I couldn't even talk to my sister when I seen her. And that's, that just pissed me off, because I'm like, I'm at school, I want to interact with my sister and stuff. It just really aggravated me, because I felt like I was intuitionalized or something. Like, but another note on Sid, what Sid was talking about the black history thing, things like that, how you get tired of hearing about the same, the same subject. I, what I don't get is why, they tell, why do they tell us black history about something bad that have happened to one of the leaders that was leading the way for us? Like, why are you telling me, keep repeating how Martin Luther King got killed on the balcony and everything like that? I know that. But tell me something about somebody who did something good and they left in a good way, not in like a negative way without getting assassinated or something like that. Like, yeah. It just gets me because I'd be sitting there and I'd be telling the teacher, like, can we learn about something about somebody who didn't get hurt? Because me thinking about my black brother got hurt, that's going to make me refuse to even listen to what you're trying to teach me. Because you just glorifying how he got hurt and how the people killed, the other people killed him. And that makes me like, oh, well, let me go get my revenge because I want to do it on account of him. But that's not the way to take it. So basically what they're doing is making us even angry and frustrated. And not understanding it is really making us powerful. But at the same time, I just really believe they should explain history to people in a like calmly matter. Cause the history thing is a serious note that comes with life. And if, if I'll sit there, I'll be, sometimes I'll be in a tearing when I hear the stories about Emmett Till and everything like that and all that, like glorifying that stuff. Like, and then it makes me turn to the other classmate that's like, not my same color, and it's like the enemy seeks in it because he wants me to mug him or something. But it's like, I'm not really trying to persuade that, but that's how it falls off. It's like they turn us against each other in the classroom and they don't know they're doing that. 
they making us all, because it's white person right here in this seat, and Latino person, a monk person or whatever, and the way they doing it is like, they turning us, like, they not noticing, it's causing animosity in the classroom, and it's making us kids not focused because we just so focused on what bad happened, and we don't think that it can be a change to it. That's why I said what I said when I was like, I don't want to hear about a black person that's getting killed for something good. I already, I mean, it happened, but I already hear sometimes about a black person who did something good, like that left without negative, and that left without in a negative way and everything like that. It's just, it don't help. But I know that at the same time that I'm here for a reason. So when I feel like I don't understand nothing and nobody else do, I know it's my part to find them, them clues to share it with the world. So I just, it's really deep though. Because I really had a hard time in history class like really paying attention because I always just hear about the negative things that happen to black brothers. It's, and even, and even other people, uh, not even my color, just negative stuff, period. It's not, that's not how you cope with someone's mind. It's not how you get in their head and get them to learn stuff when you bring in off negative attention in it. It's just not gonna work. going to say that, you know, growing up and just being in school, I, well, first off, outside of school, I didn't know the importance of school. I didn't, you know, like I said, where I grew up, um, a lot of people were poor. A lot of people couldn't even afford to go to school. They couldn't afford to stop working their job, their full-time job, grab a part, get a part-time job, and try to deal with school. So um, we started out, like, with my dad first, not he ended up getting my sister's mom um, pregnant in his senior year, and he took care of, his, of her and my sister, you know, until they were, you know, older and could, you know, manage on their own. But, um, so he never did go to school. So that was the first person I looked up to my dad for the longest. So when I, for me to know that he didn't go to school, I didn't find no importance in that. And, like, my sisters went to school, but they went to school. No one in my family has been a doctor or, you know, some type of scientist or lab technician or anything like that. The furthest that I've known is two things. Um, my sister that I was just speaking on, um, she's an accountant for a bank, and then I got a sister who's in cosmetology. Other than that, I don't, and I don't like math, and I don't like to do women's hair. <laughs> so I didn't find that important, you know? So. All the while I was going through school, I knew I had the potential to do more. I knew that, you know, I, everything in school that's ever been taught to me, even the math, I was able to do without any problems once it was explained from my teacher. But I wouldn't take out the time to go home and do my homework. I wouldn't, I barely tried to pay attention in class. And most of that was, you know, either something going on at home because I had problems at home just like everyone else. But when I went to school, my teachers, most of my teachers didn't make it, make me feel like it was important for me to learn. My teachers didn't make it seem like I, like they saw something in me, you know? It was like, for the most of the time, they would call on the white students in the class, and I had my hand raised sometimes, and I'm like, you know, I'm like, I know you just saw me, because you just pointed right behind me. And it, it, it makes me feel some kind of way. It makes me like, man, forget it. I won't even do nothing in this class then because she ain't even paying attention to me. You know, that's how it feels. It feels like your teachers don't even care about you. And, um, you know, after a while, I've just really stopped caring. But something ended up motivating me to go and actually do schoolwork because it was something I wanted to get to in life. But one of my teachers, she saw me like on the rocky path of, you know, wanting to do good, but at the same time, not feeling attached. You know what I'm saying? I feel dis like, oh, it's a disconnect. And so 
like it would be times, by the way, science is my favorite subject, and this was the science class, it was the AP class. I've never had AP classes ever in my life, but it was, um, I can't believe, I can't, it was, it was anatomy and physiology AP. And I was in the class, I would, I would come to class, I would fall asleep in the class, um, I would be up to do some of the reading and everything, because I do like science, but I just didn't care about school. So there'd be times where I fell asleep, and she'll wake me up with a question, and I'll still answer her question right, and so she'll sit there and look at me for a second like, <laughs> okay, um, that's a shame, guys, because he's sleeping, he answered my question. I've been asking y'all the same question, y'all were quiet, you know? <laughs> and so that teacher, she ended up inspiring me to actually, you know, care about my schoolwork because she pulled me aside one day and she was like, Carrie, I see how you usually do your grades. I've been, I've been noticing your grades and you usually stick between a B minus and a C plus and it makes me feel like you can do more. You're just not trying. I'm like, and she's like, I see you don't do any homework. Why you don't do homework? I said, I do schoolwork. I'm not going to go home and do homework. Because, you know. <laughs> So she was like, she didn't, she wouldn't really look at that, you know, she couldn't understand that. And she was like, why you don't do your homework? I'm like, cause I don't find it important. I'm like, why I need to do my homework when I do work here too? And she was like, no, like she was like, that's for you. That homework is not, it's a part of your grade, but it's for you to gain a better understanding of what you're learning. And like when she broke that down and she was like, she actually started just being on me more and more and more. But I bring up this because that's the person in my life that inspired me to do more in school. And at the end of that year, we had a final exam. And it was 50 questions on there and an extra credit question. I got 51 out of 50 on that test. <laughs> not only that, not only that, but at the end of the school year, I ended off in that class with a grade of 101.75. So, yeah, I just want to say that. I want um, Phelan and Nate to chime in also, and then we're going to go to another audience question. The oh, focus okay. was on education. And <laughs> <laughs> All right, for me, my experience with education is um, I always have been um, ADHD and, you know, like short attention span. So when I was coming up in school, um, I was always good at the work but I just never really applied myself. Um, and I used to be like the class clown. I used to be throwing stuff around the room, cracking jokes and stuff like that, making people laugh. Um, and then around high school, I did good. I, I, I was pushed along the whole time. And then in high school, um, around my sophomore year, my older brother had got out of prison and I sort of followed in his footsteps. And we went out and started committing crimes and I got arrested um, and did a year in jail when I was a juvenile. And um, it was coming upon my release date and they said that I can either go back to school out in the community or I could work on getting my GED there. So uh, I went for the GED route and I took my test. I didn't even have to study for them. I took the test and I passed them all. Um, and I got my GED right out of jail. Um, and since then, um, I feel like I want to get back in school, and I feel like I'm at a major disadvantage because I haven't been receiving the education that I should be right now. Like, I'm 23 years old, he's 23 years old, you know what I mean, he's a law student. I feel like, I feel like because I'm not um, educated as much as I should be, um, I feel like I'm at a major disadvantage, and so that's one of the things that I want to do um, is I'll get back in school. But I still have to solve the problem of my ADHD and my, because it's really hard for me to focus. So, um, I don't know, those are some of the things I struggled with growing up and coming in school. So. Thank you for sharing that. Phelan, did you want to chime in? Uh, I don't know, I, I was kind of like these guys when I was in school, I was a, a clown. Um, I used to always try to do things to get a rise out the teachers. But to be honest, what makes it um, to change my life and my focus on school, one was, when I got that, you know, I realized that I had a future with athletics, but also it's a good teacher. Um, I always had a teacher in my corner that really like took, you know, that took pride. Well, no, I took 
you know, was wanting to be involved in my life. You know, they took, you know, that time to talk to me and kind of tell me that I'm better than what I'm allowing myself to be in school. And I always remember uh, Miss, Miss Lehman, you know, she was my math teacher in high school. She, she would always, you know, like uh, stand in the quad when we come in and she would see me out there. She would call me over and she would talk to me. And uh, one time um, I was getting off the bus and she ended up moving like somewhere close to our neighborhood and I saw her and she invited me into her house and you know, we sit down talking and I'm like, man, this lady really does care about me, you know? And it just, it just really like woke me up to make me think that I can do better. And you know, if somebody takes the time to really, you know, invest in your life, you know, why not do better? And um, she just made me really fo love, you know, I already love math, but she made me love it even more. And you know, it was, math was always easy to me, so I can go to class, get my work done, um, and then I would clown around. But it just, once math got harder and more challenging, I spent more time doing those things. And I would always tell my teacher, like, we need to do more in this class because we have too much free time. So but when they wasn't, you know, filling that time with stuff for us to do, it opened up the door for, you know, the foolish behaviors, you know. And, and I see that now, like, uh, with our, uh, one of our daughters, she was really good at math, and she would get her assignments done, and she'll be sitting there reading a book for 30 minutes. I'm like, why can't she be doing extra stuff in the classroom? Or why can't she be moved up to a harder math class? And I feel like those are the things that hold some of our youth back, too, because they don't get challenged enough in school. And that was some of the experiences I have. But we all share stories. We can go on and on about school, but we, <laughs> we all used to, you know, have a favorite story where we used to clown around. But, you know, we, we got through it, so. How do you help family members who are in alternative schooling? Because um, I have a nephew who's in alternative schooling and I'm just like, I don't really know what to tell him or how to help him be like, you know, I know you're smart because I have conversations with you and I don't know what to do. Um, and the second one is to how to get culture and history in the classrooms. Um, I've had instances where I, at one of my jobs where we were doing the Black History Month and I was like, can we not do the cookie cutter, um, Martin Luther King Jr., Rosa Parks, Sojourner Truth, Harriet Tubman, um, things. And she was like, no, this is the book. It's, see, it's right here. It's literally a black and white picture that they were gonna color. And that was it. So I don't know how to handle both of those. I was, that's my question. So I would just say, just briefly in response to those questions, at Brotherhood, every young man um, who has been in the program has graduated from high school. That's a big part of what we do. Um, as we mentioned earlier, most of our young men have been in alternative schools and they are in alternative schools when they get to us. So a lot of times, um, Phelan will contact their school and work with the school so that they can get credit for the time that they spend working, learning business skills and entrepreneurial skills. So that helps to accelerate the process. They also have access to computers so that they can get their work done. One of the things that's interesting about alternative schools, for those who maybe have kids there or kids you work with, is that from my experience, they seem to be under-resourced. So you have kids in high school who are reading at a third or fourth grade level. And because they're in alternative schools, that doesn't mean that there's a reading specialist on staff or a psychologist on staff or somebody who's actually there to do more than babysit. Now, this isn't to knock anyone who works in an alternative school, because you all have to deal with a lot. I mean, we've been in these schools, so we know that there's a lot going on. So the problem is not for those who are committed to being there and working hard. The problem is when we see these inequities in terms of access to resources, and we keep silent. And we lose sight of why we went into those schools in the first place. So I would say, I would ask, you know, for your nephew or any other young people, if they cannot read well, who's helping them learn to read? Is it a specialist? If it's not, then we need to be there advocating. And then seeing if they need help. Most of the time, the young men come with packets or where they have to watch a video and answer a packet, and that's their instruction for the day. So we need to ask some deep questions because it's an expensive um, proposition and not enough of us are paying attention to what's going on, asking the questions and helping our young people um, in those situations. In terms of history, as you can see from the way that the guys talk about their experience, they're talking about it almost through the lens of history because of the education that goes on there. 
So we watch videos, we visit sites, and we do things that open their understanding about what has happened historically. Beyond just talking about one or two figures in history, we try to unpack what has happened historically. Actors who are known and actors who are not well known to try to inspire our young men to greatness. And when they see the range and the breadth of black history, it opens something up in them to know that they can strive for greatness and they don't have to reinforce the negative stereotypes that they see. So one of the things I would say is if you're working with young African Americans, really try to open their um, understanding through a variety of resources about history because the, the books that are used in school, from my perspective, are grossly inadequate. One, um, one key book is A People's History um, of the United States by Howard Zinn, which is excellent. I mean, it breaks down Native American history, Latino history, African American history. It's a very powerful resource. Um, and you can use those lessons to teach young people what's happening. We also speak in their language. So I don't listen to a lot of the music now. I used to listen to similar music when I was their age but I still need to know what they're talking about. Like if Contrell's like someone mugged me, you know, from, from the way we talk, we would think that that's an actual like robbery or something, but he's just talking about giving somebody a dirty look. That, you know, so, so getting in there, learning their lingo, learning what they're listening to and finding points of relation helps when you're giving them advice or suggestions for them to listen. Because it's not just a one way street, you're building a sense of reciprocity with them. And we're not saying our way is the best way or the most important way, but this is one way. Now share with me your perspective. And that's how you're able to build bridges um, with young people who've experienced some of the things that they've gone through. Yes. Hi, I'm Tanya Carrington, and it is not my intent to take away from the form of young black men. As you can see, I'm not young and I'm not a man, but I have experienced racism um, consistently since I've been a student here at Metro State. I can totally relate to the young man saying, raising his hand and wanting to ask the question or to give an answer. I'm not given that opportunity. I have had to fight four different times to get the grade that I've earned in class. At one time, I had to go through the whole committee in the chain of commands to get my C minus that the teacher felt I earned turned to a B. I have tried not to voice every instant of discriminatory behavior towards me because I didn't want it to be the one that was the problem, but I know for a fact that I'm not the problem. Um, I find it very disheartening if I ask a professor whose salary I'm paying to answer a question for me so that I'm clear on what's going on, on in class so that I can keep up with what's going on in class and not get at the point where they're not asking my question. And I've heard so many times, we'll talk about it later or come see me after class. That doesn't do me much good if you don't answer my question right then and there so that I can keep up with what's going on in class. Um, I have made a number of complaints and it's going nowhere. And I'm so frustrated because I, all I want to do is to earn my degree in criminal justice to better myself in life. And I just don't know where to turn anymore. I'm going to um, just take a second to respond. One, thank you for sharing your story. I know that it took a lot of courage for you to say that. And obviously, there's a great deal of frustration. I think one of the challenging parts of hearing that is recognizing that, that young people and older people um, at a variety of our institutions have very similar stories. And part of it has to do with institutionalized racism. I mean, that's the reality of the situation. I don't know your circumstances in particular, but I do know that you hear from students of color who, or even uh, white students who've grown up in rural areas um, it is very difficult coming into an environment where you are in the minority, where the lessons aren't necessarily tailored to your learning style, your heritage, um, and your way of, of thinking and being, and you're trying to fit into a box. 
So what I would recommend is that you would continue to bring your concerns um, to those who have the authority to make changes. And I think it helps if, if you can be as specific as possible when you are voicing those concerns. Because one of the things that's difficult is if you are part of an institution that operates a certain way, and again, this is across the board, not just at Metro State. I can give 10 examples from St. Thomas that you can give 10, you know, so it's across the board. But when you're a professor in those institutions and your perspective on race has never been challenged, your perspective on privilege has never been challenged, it is very difficult to hear from a student who's saying, I'm having trouble in this class based on how things are flowing. But I would urge you to still continue to bring those concerns forward and try to unpack what it is that is of concern because it's easy for people to say you're hypersensitive or you're just blowing things out of proportion. But the more you can unpack, this is where the problem is, or this is where my concern is, then you're able to gain some ground and build bridges. And most people in those circumstances, it's not that it's intentional, but the fact that it's not intentional isn't good enough if we're serious about truth telling and getting to the root of the matter. We're dealing with a dominant system that's been in place since before this country became the United States of America. We've had institutions built on the backs of black and brown people that have been allowed to perpetuate one generation after the next to concentrate the wealth, to continue to put forth doctrines that are harmful to people, and it hasn't been challenged. So it's up to us to learn about these systems and to, to really not only take a stand, but to persevere until we see a change begin to happen. So thank you for being willing to share that. See, I warned you guys that we were gonna get uncomfortable today. I did not plant her in the audience <laughs> to say that. And it, it, it is uncomfortable, but it opens up some dialogue that otherwise would just be lying dormant but still be creating problems. So don't shy away from it, just deal with it head on ask questions and be willing to address it. Is there another question from the audience? Hi, well, I just wanted to share that um, I've been a teacher, these EBD institutionalized teachers for 16 years, and I always thought that I totally related to my African American students because of how I was raised. I was raised in a cycle of poverty. I was out of my mom's 11 and my dad's eight kids, and nobody had ever even graduated from high school, let alone went to college. Um, both my sisters dealt drugs, one from 13 to 19, the other one, she's 27, methamphetamine, so my dad has dealt drugs since before I was born. He's 68 now, still deals drugs, still lives with his mom in Florida. I mean, that's, so that was always my way of bonding with the kids. I just wanted you guys to know, and they did. I totally bonded with them, and by the way, I do teach ACT prep, I teach acupuncture prep, ASVAB so I can get into these colleges because a lot of these kids grew up with the same thing as I did, meaning poverty and like homelessness. I wasn't ready for college when I got out of high school. You know why? Because I didn't have anywhere to sleep that night, you know? So I can relate. The epiphany at 43 years old that I've never had before is here's the difference. Ready? My sisters both dealt drugs all that time. My dad's still dealing drugs 45 years. They've never, ever been to prison. Mm -hmm. None of them have any records. My dad walks around. I won't tell you where he is, but he deals with <laughs> drugs, you know, doing his thing. And even though when I was a little kid, he had a Scooby Doo van with a marijuana leaf on it, never been pulled over. I don't even remember ever getting in trouble, ever. The police never found us. Okay? That's the difference. That's some white privilege. Epiphany. She definitely flipped the script, didn't she? <laughs> yes. How you guys doing? My name is Terrence. I'm somewhat on the same line as you guys. Uh, I just want it's not you know, to get into what I do or nothing like that, but I just want to say to you brothers down there that I commend you guys for being able to step forward and speak about some of the stuff because 
I have walked them shoes, and to this day, I still have those shoes on. Um, I commend you people here in the audience that's taking time out of your day um, from working to come hear this because, to be honest, that's, that's a real big issue in our community. Um, my question is, how do I get information? I'm from Minneapolis Northside. Um, I stumped them grounds, Plymouth Avenue, growing up, so I seen that light. But at the same time, I was able to flip my mind strip based on the surroundings and take my step a little bit further. So on one, it is opportunities and things out here that you guys can get into. You're in the right place. Keep moving forward. Don't let nothing de deprive you guys from that. Other than that, I would just like to get more information about you guys as an organization to maybe bring that to my community because North Minneapolis, I never heard of you guys. And it's touching to be here right now, to hear it. And I mean, I was one where I didn't want to get up <laughs> to say anything, but that's a boundary that I'm fighting with myself to be able to speak out and say. So I just want to commend you guys for all of this here and just more knowledge. <laughs> Thank you. Well, you touched on something important, which is um, w in terms of using your voice. My hope today is that more men who've walked your shoes will feel like they have a voice in society and they'll be able to speak truth to power in light of those experiences. And for those of us who haven't walked in, in those shoes, that we will be willing to receive what you're saying. Not second guess what you're saying, but ask questions so that we can get a deeper understanding. So I commend you for that. In terms of learning more about our organization, we will have um, a table set up over lunch. I'm gonna ask Sadiq to talk a little bit about you know, who, you know, he, he's chomping at the bit because he's, you know, the sales and event manager. So I'm going to turn it over to him. Everything that we sell is fresh, organic, fair trade, coffee, tea, and hot chocolate. All of the revenue that is gained from Brotherhood Brew is going back into the, pro, uh, the program to help us continue earning wages and continue bringing more young men into the program so they can get the help that they need and just have the same opportunities that we have. And I also has a, have a business card right here, man. You know what I'm saying? I, 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 I brought a whole bunch of them just in case. You know what I'm saying? So it'd be dope if y'all came out there and checked us out. You know, I will be signing coffee bags uh, you know, if, if you guys want me to. But you know, if, if you don't, I, I really understand if you don't want to, but it'd be dope if I did, but so yeah. And I'm, I'm from Northside Minneapolis too, man, so. Good morning, my name is Roy Adams. I'm a supervisor in Ramsey County. Um, for many years, I actually worked in probation. And so since we're telling the truth today, um, the messenger, super powerful to me because I contributed to your horrible experience all day. You know, for me, I would look at situations like kidneys and psychological, send them to Wyatt Lucing. It's only 30 days. Today, my truth is, is that 30 days is 30 days too long. So my idea of getting through my workday was about hurry up and get this work done. Knowing in my personal life, we impact young black men or people of color every single day, but separating that reality from work. So I challenge us all to realize that policies and things like that and getting through your workday changes people's lives forever. So when the messenger said, you're not helping us, you're hurting us. Well, that's my truth. My truth is, is that I've been contributing that as somebody who has a degree in criminology, communications and separating work from life and sleeping good at night. So I would say to you guys, thanks for bringing your reality to my work day. I know as a young black man, we got to struggle every day, but I also think to myself, I got to feed my family. And that's a battle that will fight forever, that do the right thing no matter what. So thank you guys for just sharing your stories and bringing your realities to the reality of what we're dealing with.
Hi, I just want to say I'm a teacher in Minneapolis Public Schools, and I worked at a school where I said, um, this is, we were talking about privilege, this is a land built, you know, on stolen land, here we are, on slave labor. And I was deemed a radical at my school by administration, too. And, you know, not only can we also encourage teachers to continue to push back, we need to encourage our administration to also understand what we're doing, where we're coming from. And I would encourage all of us to find some support, because when, they, when, I, was, when I was called a radical, guess what I did? I had to walk away, and I had to leave that school, and I had to go somewhere else where I knew that my truth could be told and understood and accepted, and I am now in a different school. I also want to say that standardized curriculum is becoming more and more prevalent. That means the white frames are telling us what we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Who writes the standards? White, it's all written in white frames, all of it. Who writes the standardized tests? It's all written in white frames. And so for us to also continue to be critical of standardized testing, standardized curriculum is extremely important. Thank you. Before we go to the next question, Darius has tried to hide throughout this discussion, so I just want to ask him if there's anything that you want to share as this conversation is unfolding about your experience at Brotherhood or about being a young black man. I could just say that being a young black man, I deal with a lot of stereotypes and at the same, on the same level, a lot of racism because I'm from Chicago, and they look at, well, as I see, a lot of people fr from Chicago is different from people in Minnesota or any other state, you know what I'm saying? It's not the same. And the way I do things, the way I dress, they look at me different. The way I talk, it seems like don't nobody understand what I say. Like, Darius, Darius. That's not my name. <laughs> <laughs> but. Yeah, it's just, like, that stuff bothers me. Like, I'm the same kind of human you is. Just a different gender. And that's all I really have to say. Mm -hmm. With the scarf? Oh. Hi, my name is oh, Holly. Oh, oh go. so go ahead. I didn't see you at the top. And then we'll go to you with the scarf. Me? Go ahead. Oh, good. Uh, my name is Porch McLean, and I'm here today because of Tima and the young men down there. Uh, I'm doing the conference on uh, African American English, and they have set the stage for me to be able to talk about that language piece and how it it's, it hinders them and in school and in the community with the police officers. So I just wanted to say that um, I enjoy listening to you all and your experience. I grew up in segregation, born and raised in segregation, went through the same issues that you went through. I'm originally from Chicago by way of Mississippi, but I spoke a Creole English and so knowing that this is an important subject and knowing that these young people need to know their culture. They need to have that curriculum. They need to connect to something. I heard someone talking about math and science. The highest rate of failure in, in the Twin Cities is between math and science among young African American men. And I know that because I've been a teacher and I know that that failure rate is due to the fact that they have no connection to their cultural history about what African Americans have contributed to this society in math and science. If you can't do math, you can't do science. If you can't do science, you can't do math. And that's very important that we make a connection to these young people so that they know that we have contributed to medicine, we have contributed to inventions, we've contributed to everything, and yet our young people have no clue about. I taught a class and I asked the kids what have African Americans contributed to society. And I got from 30 young people, drugs, prostitution, crime, and I, would, I had to cry. 
It was so sad that they had no knowledge, high school level, no knowledge of what African Americans have contributed to this society. We can't connect them unless we do it in the classroom to connect them to what we have contributed, what we have had to do, and the progress of this country. And for those who, for those who teach, I'd recommend um, connecting with Portia. She came to discussions at Encounter and she basically broke down for us how the way that we speak has its roots in history, but a lot of times it's disregarded within mainstream society and it sends a message to young people, especially African Americans, that the way they talk, the way that they speak is not good enough. And it actually turns them off from wanting to get an education. So if you are teaching in the classroom, I'd recommend connecting with her. She has a really powerful presentation where she breaks things down and helps to bridge that gap between what we know in the mainstream and what is the reality for African Americans. Yes. Hi, my name is Holly, and um, I'm up here. <laughs> Hi. Um, and I just wanted to say that a, a couple of things. Thanks for uh, presenting and being here, and it's been incredible to hear you speak. My son goes to um, a voluntary integration school that's a public school in the East Metro area. It serves 10 districts. And I remember going in there for the first time, and I've worked in the St. Paul Public Schools in the past, and um, it was the first time I'd ever walked into a lunchroom and saw children not self-segregating, actually sitting together. I noticed that the, um, the text he's reading for his seventh grade um, humanities is Howard Zinn's book, and uh, I was really pleased to see that. And I guess that I would say that um, to whoever talked about Black History Month and um, about bringing other figures um, in African American history and in other, you know, other cultural groups um, in our country, in our world, that they not be number one just in one month, <laughs> celebrated in one month, it's crazy, and number two, that um, we don't just teach um, African-American history to our African-American children, but that we please teach good African-American history like what you taught to all of our children, to our white children, to our American children, our Hispanic and Latino children. So um, thank you, and please take, take heed of that because uh, it's, it, it needs to, to move beyond. Thanks so much. Thank you for that. So we have time for two more comments. I promised this young lady in the scarf, and then we have one comment back there. So if you can stand and just project your no, no, voice. No, no. I need a mic. Oh, you need a microphone. A okay. So two more comments. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Leah Peterson. I'm a sophomore at um, WS Winona State University. Uh, my question is, there are some teachers who um, are teaching about white privilege and race and gender and all that kind of stuff, but they're still teaching from that privileged viewpoint. So my question is, how do you get them to realize that it's still a little bit different, and how do you get them to start teaching from a different viewpoint? That's the million dollar question. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I mean, just being in an, uh, an institution of higher education, it's important for us to look at how we are teaching teachers to teach. That is one aspect of the problem right there. We're using antiquated models in a lot of our institutions of higher education. We're not breaking down privilege and teaching them to be more engaging. There are some um, folks out there, I think Mamie Hostetter is one, hopefully I'm saying her last name correctly. She's from Minnesota and she's been training teachers on how to be more engaging in the classroom and to, to bridge that cultural divide. So I would say look for the resources that are out there. Have some one-on-ones. If you have knowledge to share, have coffee with someone and try again, as I was saying to um, the woman earlier, being as specific as possible. Because sometimes people are wearing blinders about the reality of what's happening because that false reality is all around them. So we have to spend the time helping to unpack that situation, breaking it down, and supplying folks with resources. 
like the new Jim Crow, like um, Howard Zinn's um, People's History of the United States, and there's other books out there as well that could be helpful, as well as videos. One more. Um, my last, or the comment that I want to make is, um, I don't, this would bring, uh, be an entirely different discussion, time for that. But I just wanted to mention that all of these things that are true for the educational system are also true in healthcare. I work in healthcare. Racism is alive and well in the white system that runs the healthcare system in this country, and that we really have to do a better job of educating people in the healthcare system about this too. And if I had more time, I would love to hear, because I'm a sexuality educator, I'd love to hear more about how the racism that, ha that impacts um, African-American people's sexuality, how that's impacted you and uh, your relationships and what you learned or didn't learn about sexuality and relationships both at home and in school. But that's a whole nother topic. <laughs> well, thank you for <laughs> bringing that to us. So you're right, racism is alive and well in healthcare. These guys will be around over lunch, of the lunch hour. Please drop by their table. They would be happy to engage you in that discussion. My hope is that we'll have some more nuanced discussions in the future and add in that dimension about healthcare because it's literally life or death for a number of people. So with that, I just want to thank you all for your time and your attention. Please join me in thanking our wonderful panel. Thank you.